Thanks, Peter, and thanks uh, to everyone for, for having me out here, a, a foreigner, uh, to lead things off. Is, there's some pressure involved in that, but uh, hopefully I uh, present some, some things that uh, will resonate with you guys uh, up here in Manitoba. So uh, when Peter contacted me a couple months ago, he said that the theme was growing the game, and uh, he said, you know, Minnesota's doing a lot of great things to grow the game, and hoping you can come up and give some tangible things that people can take back to their communities or their, their teams and, and get more kids playing hockey. And, and I think I can do that, uh, but you're going to have to bear with me because I think there's something in Minnesota that goes beyond just some easy things to implement in your communities. Um, and I have to admit, I feel a little funny as an American coming up to Canada and saying this is how we do things down in America. It's similar to someone from Ireland coming to America and saying, here's how you can get more basketball players. So bear with me, you know, take what I say with a grain of salt. Uh, but Minnesota has been successful in getting more kids playing hockey, especially in recent years. Um, and I believe there's a major factor in that and, and it goes beyond just um, some tangible things that you can take back. So I'm gonna start off with a video and if I offend you in any way or if what I say is crazy in your mind as we go forward, at the very least, hopefully you can say um, I showed you a cool video to start off with. And I won't comment on this video right when it ends. I'm going to um, comment on it later in the presentation. But as you're watching this, I just kind of want you to pay attention to kind of what you're observing and what feelings you have inside as, as you're watching it. So I'm going to start this here. So like Peter said, I've, I've been doing this for five years with Minnesota hockey. I'm going on my sixth season now, and I, I spent nine years prior to that working for the Minnesota Wild. So my entire career has been in hockey. Um, I also grew up in it. I'm from Duluth, Minnesota, which is not too far away from here. Uh, it's with, at least within driving distance. Um, I grew up playing hockey there, so I was a part of this. Um, but quite honestly, I never really understood what it was to play hockey in Minnesota and really never thought about it until I was in the role that I'm in now. So in, in five years, I've come to understand a lot of how Minnesota hockey is structured, especially a lot about how hockey in the United States is structured. And I would say a little bit of how it's structured in Canada, but I'm certainly no expert in it. So again, whatever I say is pertinent to Minnesota and the United States. Not necessarily to Canada, but hopefully it will, will resonate a little bit. But I have some observations in these five years and some questions that I have just kind of have been in my head and then have been put into a presentation uh, that I'm going to show you tonight. And, and one of the observations is flattening the pyramid. So one thing that Minnesota does really, really well is we flatten the pyramid. We have kids that pl the most kids that play, and they play for a longer period of time than the average uh, community or state in the United States. We have this community-based model in Minnesota, and from what I understand, it's fairly similar here in Manitoba, but in Minnesota, you play where you live or where you go to school. That's the community-based model. And a lot of models don't do this. Uh, they weed kids out really early. I know there's um, been some conversation or some controversy in, in Toronto about uh, how 6U players at, on elite teams are uh, combating this idea of going down to cross ice or uh, against their full ice wishes. And, and to me, the question isn't really why. Uh, it's not about the smaller rinks. It's about why do you have elite players at 6U. I don't really understand that. So that's one thing that Minnesota is good about is we don't weed players out too early. The other question I have is why is the finish line uh, for this marathon of development 
why is it at the 14 mile marker? Or I guess the kilometer marker in Canada. Um, but why do we put these unimportant finish lines uh, that parents and players are motivated by um, when really they mean very little in the grand scheme of things? Another question, and this might make more sense as this presentation goes along, but why isn't there more developmental community hockey? And also, why is developmental community hockey kind of brushed aside in a lot of areas as <clears throat> impossible or simply um, not what we do here or we couldn't do that here? It wouldn't be, wouldn't be possible to do that here. And then another question that, again, might make more sense as I go along in this presentation, but is 120 Bantam captains better than eight Bantam captains? And we'll, I'll have you think about that a little bit more. So before I really get into it, I want to do some uh, full disclosure on myself. Um, if you're looking at your phones and wondering who this guy is, um, you're not going to find me on EliteProspects.com or HockeyDB.com. This is me here at the peak of my hockey playing career. Um, best player on the ice by far. Uh, if you think the hair was good, you should have seen the hands. Um, but my dad's not here, so you're just going to have to take my word for it that I was really, really good at that point. But uh, it wasn't downhill for me after that. I, was, I think I'm seven or eight in that picture, but I was never going to achieve stardom in hockey. Uh, I just knew that I loved hockey, kept playing it through high school, uh, made my best friends through hockey. They were in my wedding, um, and that's just kind of what it was for me. Again, I didn't think about it at the time and, and didn't really think about it until in my, my role. Another thing I have to admit is I call these breezers. I had no idea until I graduated college that people outside of Minnesota call them hockey pants. And the reason I put this in here is, again, just to reiterate the fact that I am from Minnesota. That is my point of reference. I've never lived anywhere else outside of Minnesota. I've never coached hockey or been an administrator or played hockey anywhere outside of Minnesota. So, again, take whatever I say with a grain of salt and realize I have my Minnesota colored glasses on. And if you say I don't get how you guys do it here, if I don't understand it, you're right. I, I really don't. Um, I really understand mostly what happens in Minnesota. Another thing I'll admit is this guy right here, his name is Mike Snee. He is the executive director of College Hockey Inc. And he had my role right before I took over the role. Um, but he's a good friend of mine. And he and I are both really passionate about this topic that I'm going to share with you tonight. And he's given this presentation, I've given it, we've given it together. So I wanted to share this with you, just so in case you have seen this presentation somewhere else uh, given by Mike, I promise I didn't steal it from him, we, we worked on this together. Uh, I'm gonna m reference Mike throughout the, the presentation as well, and, and you should know that he also sucks at hockey. And then lastly, I hope that by 7.15 tonight I've had a point um, I really hope that what I say kind of resonates and I feel like the right people are in the room, that we have volunteers and, and people who aren't making their living off hockey. It's just people who love the game, love kids, and want to provide them a great hockey experience. So I feel like I'm in the right place. Um, and I think this message might resonate more with, with people like that than people who do make their uh, the profit off hockey. And lastly, I'd rather listen. Again, I'm not an expert in anything. Um, I'd rather hear from you guys what works, what doesn't. Um, but I love talking hockey, and I love talking about this topic. So if you have anything um, that I should know or I could bring back to Minnesota, I'd love to hear it. And you can find me this weekend, or you can contact me at any one of those, uh, any one of those uh, methods. So here we go. So Minnesota and North America are very different, at least from what I can gather in my five years doing this. Um, again, Minnesota is my point of reference, uh, but I feel like I know enough to be dangerous, at least about the rest of America, and like I said, a little bit about Canada. And these comparisons are as far as I know, but no one can dispute that Minnesota is very, very different when it comes to how we're structured than the rest of the United States. Very different. So in Minnesota, we're a community-based model uh, our youth associations and high schools, there are no free agents. So you either play where you live or you play where you go to school. You're not going over to this area because they got a good coach or you're not going over to this town because they've got a really good group of uh, 05s coming up. You play where you live. 
And it's because you play where you live that you have these hockey towns throughout Minnesota. So Roseau, right down the road here, War Road, Edina, Eden Prairie, Lakeville, Grand Rapids, Blaine, White Bear Lake, Bemidji, and on and on and on. There's all these towns that when you say those cities, people say that's a hockey town. Even non-hockey people will know that that's a hockey town in Minnesota. So it is their identity in these towns. And even if we had free agency, no one would take advantage of it, or few people, I think, would take advantage of it. And I'll use Roseau as an example because it's, I think many people might know Roseau because it's so close to the Canadian border. But if you told a Roseau kid, um, hey, you can go play for War Road now, they'd never do it. They will always wear green, and the War Road kid would be the same way. I'll never wear green. I'm never going over to that community. And in Minnesota, winning state means everything. That's what kids aspire to do. They want to win state or even get to state. And that's true in high school. That's true in Peewees or Bantams, 12U girls, 15U girls. They want to get to the state tournament. It's not the national championship. That's not what they aspire to do. So in Minnesota, we have 140 some associations, all community-based associations. And you'll remember I talked about um, that Bantam question, if, is having 110 Bantam qu Bantams captains better than having eight? Um, so we have 110 Bantam A teams in the state. So at the highest level of Bantam hockey, we have 110 teams. If you compare that with Michigan, they have eight top level Bantam teams. Chicago has four. Uh, some other states have around that, that many. So these teams, they play 45 to 50 games throughout the year, sometimes a few more games than that. But 30 to 35 of those are league games with other communities in their area, their district of Minnesota. And then they'll play three or four local tournaments within the state, uh, mostly within their area. If you live in the metro area, you might take one trip up to Duluth or Moorhead or Brainerd, you know, a three-hour car ride for your, for your trip where you're staying in a hotel, kids are swimming in the pool, parents are going to the bar, and everybody loves it. Um, so five sessions on the ice per week on average. Uh, that includes practices and games, and then there's off-ice training as well. Uh, again, Minneapolis-St. Paul player rarely leaves a metro area. And then our tryouts, which this is unique to Minnesota, which I really just learned in the last year or so, our tryouts start in uh, late September, October. Um, and in other parts of the country, meaning the U.S., that's not the case. They're starting way earlier than that. Their, their uh, season goes way longer, starts earlier, goes longer, and uh, I really kind of feel like that inhibits a little bit the ability to do other sports and, and to make the season manageable. But I will point out that in Minnesota, in the summertime, you can go nuts. There's AAA hockey. Free agency is a part of that. You can go wherever you want. Um, but the cool thing is it's not, it's separate from Minnesota hockey, and it's also not viewed as important by the regular Minnesota hockey player. They still aspire to be on that winter team and win a state tournament with their, with their friends. Um, but that's not to say that people don't do it, but it's, I think it's less prevalent in Minnesota than it might be in some other areas. And there's certainly a lot of uh, multi-sport athletes in Minnesota. So the rest of North America, or at least the rest of the US, is not quite community-based. They might have a city name on their jersey, but it's certainly different. And when I say not quite, there might be an organization that's a nonprofit, but their coaches make quite a bit of money. So I would consider that not quite community-based. So um, when Mike and I were doing some research for this project, Mike emailed a colleague of his uh, to ask about a team that he coaches. And uh, he's in one of the areas I already mentioned earlier on. And in that, I'm sorry to make you read a, an email, so I'll, I'll just skim through it, but he said, he said this, although our 2002 birth year team won the state AAA championship this past season, many of the kids decided to leave his developing hockey city, I won't name names, for this coming year. We had an outstanding goalie and he was recruited by an established hockey community. So he went there and he thinks that started a cascade effect of others not wanting to be left out. So they opted for some other, some other things. So when you think about that, no one can explain to me how that's a good thing for either community because you're, you know, this established hockey community has all these goalies that are now getting bumped down. The growing hockey community loses their best player, their goalie, and 
as a side effect, loses a bunch of other players. And I just don't understand how that's good for either community and really even the goalie himself who was, you know, turned himself into a great goalie playing in this developing hockey city. And then another thing that uh, we saw in our research was about five years ago, there was a quote from a junior hockey coach uh, in the USHL, and he had a couple kids from Minnesota. They were from the same high school. And in the U.S., you can go play junior hockey prior to your high school season and then come back if you want. And they did that. They went for a weekend and played a couple of USHL games. And then they went back to their, uh, their high school to finish out their senior year. And again, sorry to make you read a, a quote like this, so I'll read it for you. He said, we tried to keep them here again this weekend, but for some reason, kids from Minnesota want to go back and play a lower level of hockey. To me, playing at a lower level, if you're a serious hockey player, does not make sense. You don't get better playing at lower levels, but for some reason, the culture in Minnesota, they think it's more important to play in front of a big crowd and their girlfriends. So this got pe people riled up. I will point out that these two players uh, finished their senior year. They both went to the same Division I college. One is still there and one signed an NHL contract this past off season. Uh, I don't think he'll start the year in the NHL, but I uh, have no doubt that he'll be there very soon. So it seemed to work out okay for them. But I guess what I'm trying to say is this guy is like many others outside of Minnesota and that, you know, that, that's a cute little model you have there, but it doesn't work. You're gonna get left behind if you keep doing what you're doing. So in Minnesota, we're, we're nonprofit. Um, all of our rinks are, are uh, municipally owned, so they don't pay taxes. They don't need to turn a profit to be successful. Obviously, that keeps ice costs way down for us, which is a great thing. Uh, I'll have a little bit more on the next slide that, that <coughs> illustrates that. Um, so we have pr public arenas. The only rinks we have that are private, there's two rinks owned by the same guy that are private, and then some small studio rinks for three-on-three -three hockey and things like that. So the rest are all owned by the community. And then all of our associations are volunteer based and I think that's similar here to Manitoba. Uh, our high school hockey teams are subsidized. So you're, some schools do charge kids to play but you're basically paying um, less than you would to play mite hockey if you're in high school hockey. And then obviously in Minnesota we are um, a cold weather state. There's no doubt about that. So we have advantages from then some of the other uh, states in the United States, but um, you know, Manitoba has the same thing where outdoor rinks are prevalent. And we take advantage of those, uh, maybe not as much as we should, but we certainly do use them. So I took two associations in, in Minnesota to kind of show you what the cost of hockey is there. <laughs> Minneapolis is very similar to most areas in the Twin Cities um, as far as the cost of hockey. So. A mighty might six under will play pay three twenty five for the year. Uh, a bantam close to seventeen hundred dollars for the year. Cloquet is a northern Minnesota town, a smaller community, uh, but definitely a hockey tradition there, a rich hockey tradition. Uh, their bantams are paying about eleven hundred dollars for the year. Now again, kids will play summer hockey, so tack on another two or three thousand dollars for that. The travel that goes along with that, but. Comparatively to the rest of the country and the rest of the United States, we're doing pretty well. And our communities put hockey up there with local parks and fire departments in that they want to provide this community service to the kids. It's that important to them. Um, so they're not going to vote down a referendum to tear down or vote for a referendum that might tear down a rink or something like that. I had uh, a Michigan arena owner say this to me at a uh, USA Hockey Annual Congress my first year on the job, <clears throat> and I really didn't understand what he meant right away, uh, but the further I got into my role, the, the more uh, I understood what he was talking about. And he said, the Minnesota's greatest strength is that very few people in Minnesota make a living at youth hockey. And then he said, this is also the biggest threat to hockey in Minnesota. And that uh, certainly resonates with me now because as rosy as a picture as I might paint here today. Uh, we certainly have our threats, um, and it's certainly people that uh, want to come in and, and make some more money off, off the kids in, in uh, our state. So the rest of North America is not quite nonprofit. Again, that same coach in Michigan that we emailed about the goalie, uh, we also emailed them 
Do you know what the fees are to pay, play bantam hockey at the club where you coach? Pretty direct question, and his answer was, was pretty eye-opening. I'm not positive on the total amount, but I feel it is somewhere around $15,000. We have one of the lowest fees around due to shared practice once a week, limited travel, and no coaches making money. We had a team from New Jersey come out last week. We have a fall tier one league for our 14 and 15 year old players. And, and uh, we got to talking about the structure there and the structure in Minnesota. And they were kind of curious about, about what we do. And, and so we kind of told them, yeah, you know, we're community based and, you know, a band of player pays about $2,000 a year to play. And, and they just kind of looked confused for a while. And then they just kind of, it just didn't register with them. You know, and they said, you know, in New Jersey, it costs us $10,000 on the downstroke. That's before they go travel to Connecticut and Minnesota and Florida and all these places. So um, so I equate talk like this to dance. And what I mean by that is when I've been in office settings and I, you know, you make small talk with people in the office, when people talked about their kids being in dance, I immediately said I'm never putting my kid in dance. They talk about the recitals, how long they are, how long you have to sit through them even though your kid is done dancing, how much it costs, how many nights a week it is, and immediately my brain turns to, I'm never putting my kids in dance. And I'll sacrifice my Father of the Year award, but I just don't want to do it. And I truly believe that's what hockey faces is, is when people say, oh, you're paying 15 grand a year prior to traveling all over the country. Um, you know, no thanks. I think that's, uh, you know, as much as we don't want to admit that, that happens. And in Canada and Minnesota, we all say we have a lot of kids playing hockey. But I think a study was done that in Minnesota, about 6% of kids play hockey. And I think in Canada, it was closer to 10%. But that's still a lot of kids that aren't playing hockey. So a lot of families are turning it down for whatever reason. And I think it might be because of things like this. So another question I'm going to ask is how important is inspiration? And I promised you I'm getting to the point here um, about growing the game. And hopefully this relates to growing the game. But when I ask about inspiration, I think we all know that kids get inspired by the NHL team, OK? The Winnipeg Jets. They might get inspired by kids on a college team or a junior team. Their parents and friends and siblings all inspire them to play hockey. But in Minnesota, and this is unique to us, is high school players are as inspirational as NHL players. And I put this picture up here. Uh, I don't know if people in here are familiar with Moorhead. It's a northern Minnesota town, huge hockey power. Um, yes, they're called the Spuds. They're named after a potato. Um, but this kid, uh, he's a great player. His name is Carter Rancliff, scored this goal. This is a road game in Grand Rapids, Minnesota, about three or two and a half hours away from Moorhead. You can see how many kids are in the background there celebrating this goal in a, in a town two and a half hours away. They're all wearing their Spuds jerseys. You know, here's another picture. Again, don't pay attention to what's going on inside the glass. Look at what's happening outside the glass. And look at these kids all just living and dying with what these high school athletes are, are doing in, in the state of Minnesota. Here's some girls again, hands up against the glass, nose pressed against the glass, just watching every move of these high school kids in their community. These are people that they might live two houses down from or see at the grocery store or you know, their parents teach together or something like that. So it's, it's really unique that these, the best players in Minnesota are just playing for their local high school. So I don't have any stats or graphs to you know, measure inspiration and what it means to kids in, in hockey, but I do have this quote this is from Casey Middlestad, and here's a picture of Casey when he was a mite, uh, standing next to his buddy Nick Lieberman, who has been his teammate since he was five years old, and they just graduated high school together at Eden Prairie. And by the way, Casey was the eighth overall pick in the NHL draft this year. And Casey said, when I was a young hockey player, I loved going to the high school games to watch Nick Letty, now the New York Islanders, Kyle Rao, now the Minnesota Wild, and all the Eagles. I wanted to be just like them. Okay, so. Casey was inspired by these kids wearing the same jersey when they're 18, and he's wearing the same jersey as when he's five, and he's wearing that same jersey along with his best friend all the way up until they're 18 years old. And, and coincidentally, they're going to the University of Minnesota together too. 
Uh, so again, I have no statistics on inspiration. I do have this photo. This is of my hometown in Duluth. This is 5,000 plus standing outside for a, an outdoor high school hockey game. Uh, I, I don't have any graphs to, to talk about inspiration, but I do have this photo. Again, this is a team that didn't even win state, but this is a game to get to the state tournament. They eventually did win state. And I can guarantee you that in six to eight years from now, there's going to be another kid from Eden Prairie or somewhere else who's going to say, when I was a young hockey player, I loved watching high school games, watching Middlestad and Lieberman, and I wanted to be just like them. So these generations are, keep forming. It happens all, over, all the time. There's a community in Blaine where a kid named Matt Hendricks went on to the NHL. He inspired a kid named Nick Bugstad. He inspired a kid named Riley Tufty. So just elite players just look up to these kids in their community. So now I'm going to talk about that video that I showed you at the end. And the reason I asked you to, to pay attention to what you were feeling is imagine you're watching from this vantage point, this picture right here, and imagine you're a six, seven, eight-year-old boy or girl from Stillwater seeing this happen, and how can you not want to be a part of that? And I put that quote in there because I was talking to a, a a dad who lives in Stillwater, a friend of mine, and there was some commotion in the background. He said, oh, sorry, I got I to gotta move away. I my kid's in the driveway doing the, <clears throat> doing the Kate spin. So, and then the other question I ask of people who kind of don't understand Minnesota is, is what if Noah Cates, who's a, an excellent hockey player, he's gonna, he was a fifth-round pick this year. He'll be playing Division I college hockey in Duluth. What if he had said, you know, this, this model's nice, but in order to become a great player, I got to leave. I got I to gotta get to a higher level of hockey and become a better player. Not only does he miss out on this moment, but so does every little kid in that arena watching him play. So earlier this summer, the Minnesota Wild put together a video for high school captains. They came down um, to just kind of get a day of leadership training. And so they put this video together and I said, well, geez, can I use that? Because the people that are quoted in this video, you will find on EliteProspects.com, and maybe it'll resonate even more than my words will. That's it. Growing up in Minnesota, is uh, playing hockey is as good as it gets, and all your buddies play it. You go on the outdoor rinks all winter long and play with your friends, and um, it's just something special about Minnesota that um, the game of hockey is so, I guess, beloved and uh, important to people. There's a couple of us that had the opportunity to leave after our junior year to go play. We looked at each other and like, hey, we're staying. We stayed and uh, went on to feed that year, won the state tournament. Just a, a really cool way to, uh, to end your high school career. I guess this is our wild play of the game right here. Oshie diving for that puck. There's a lot of different options nowadays to go to juniors, to go play AAA. Uh, my recommendation to the parents and the kids is the grass isn't always greener. I got all my skill set. I learned everything about hockey from my youth coaches all the way up. So I, I think the tradition is so rich here, you really don't have to leave. And uh, for that, I feel very fortunate. Florida's pleased to select from Blaine High School in Minnesota, Nick Bugstad. People always kind of say, oh, well, you guys play high school hockey, but that's what's it's good here. You don't really know how good you got it in Minnesota. There's great coaches, there's great opportunities everywhere, great camps. Janetta lost it, clear, they score! They score! Eden Prairie wins! Oh, what a play and what a goal. NHL scouts have taken notice that there's good players here and uh, they'll go to high school games up in Ely, Minnesota, if they have to, they'll find you. We're lucky that we don't have to travel very far or change leagues to get notice in advance. I think that's really unique about our state, and I think everyone should take advantage of that. You know, I remember growing up, and, and you look up to the high school hockey players, and those are the guys that you want to be like when you're, you're playing peewees and bantams. A lot of great female hockey players came out of Roseville. You had the Curtin sisters, uh, the Broke sisters, and they were players I really looked up to. You know, you grow up idolizing the high school hockey players in your hometown. If you can see people be, become something, it helps you kind of say, yeah, I can do that too. Nick Letty from Eden Prairie, Minnesota, gets selected by the Wilds. Come on! 
Uh, it's unbelievable. Especially to get drafted by your hometown. It's, it'll be a lot of fun. You just kind of got to know each individual on your team and kind of know what's best for them. Get to know each player and help them understand what their role is and then help them fulfill that role to the best of their ability while, again, recognizing and telling them that they are a super important part of the team. There's so much pressure to, to be great, to do this, to do that, to you know make varsity as a freshman or to play on this team and be on the summer team and whatnot, but just have fun. Don't shy away from the spotlight. I mean, I think it's about making the most of your opportunity. You can't get distracted by trying to be in control all the time. That's really not what being, I think, a good leader is. Just enjoy it when you're young. Uh, if you're just worrying about your future, playing uh, junior college hockey probably won't happen. So if you just enjoy it when you're younger and have fun and develop, you'll, you'll make it. Case with a goal! Ryan Paling. So another American player selected. Ryan Paling from Lakeville, Minnesota. The Buffalo Sabres are pleased to select from Eden Prairie, Casey Middlestad. So there he is. We were just talking about him. Minnesota's Mr. Hockey. No matter what your role is, it's important and it's helpful, and you have to focus on doing that role to the best of your ability. Now Colin and Frost, Chelsea scores! Just make the most of it. Soak it all in. So after seeing that, I want to take you just back to that quote from that junior hockey head coach real quick. And I highlighted the end where even when he's bashing Minnesota uh, and the structure of our hockey here or there, um, he, he kind of admits, you know, they think it's important to play in front of a big crowd and their girlfriends. So he, he's acknowledging that hockey in Minnesota is fun. OK, there, there's not really any disputing that. Um, you know, and hopefully I've shown you that hockey is pretty affordable in Minnesota. Uh, it's manageable by meaning you can play it, but you can play other sports. It's not all year round or doesn't have to be anyway. And hopefully I showed you that it's inspirational to these kids in, in Minnesota and, and really does get more kids wanting to play to want to be a part of that culture. But then the question is, does it work? And obviously that guy doesn't think it works, um, but I don't think he's done a lot of research on it. And quite frankly, I didn't do a lot of research on it until we started working on this presentation because we got sick of people like him saying that about Minnesota. So here's what we found. Last year, there were 47 NHL players from Minnesota. Uh, and if you want to look up who they were, they're pretty impressive. There are not a lot of guys that only played one or two games last year. There were uh, some big point producers, some very skilled players. Michigan was number two at 42. Massachusetts had 26. Uh, the rest of the states weren't, weren't really anywhere close to those three. Uh, in the draft last year, there were 17 picks from Minnesota, five came from Michigan, and four from Massachusetts. And in the uh, last 15 drafts, 25% of American players have come from Minnesota. And in those 15 drafts, Minnesota had the most picks of any state except for one draft. So 14 of the 15, they had more players drafted. And keep in mind that in terms of population, Minnesota's smaller than both Massachusetts and Michigan. Uh, Minnesota had nine players on the, on the 2016 U.S. World Cup team. Michigan had three. Other states had two. I won't talk about that one as much because that didn't go so well. Um, but if you want to dig into these, these 47 uh, kids from Minnesota or players from Minnesota, 41 of them played high school hockey. The rest of them mostly played at a prep school in Minnesota called Shattuck St. Mary's. And then one, uh, Dustin Bufflin, Winnipeg Jet, uh, played major junior. He's the only Minnesotan to do that, uh, currently playing in the NHL anyway. But these stats here were pretty eye-opening to me. So of those 41 that played high school hockey, 31 different high schools were represented. No school had more than three NHL players, so there's no hockey factory. Uh, in Minnesota where they're just churning out NHL prospects. They come from everywhere. Uh, 20 from the Minneapolis-St. Paul metro area and 11 from the non-metro area. 24 public schools and seven private schools. 22 large AA schools and nine small schools. And the majority of those kids played uh, their senior year of high school. So again, these kids come from everywhere. There's no real rhyme or reason other than the just 
they're just supremely talented kids that, that uh, played for a long time. Some were great when they were little, others were late bloomers. And I know Roger Grillo, I'm sure, will talk about that uh, when he speaks tomorrow. Um, but these stats to me refute that you need to start weeding kids out, let alone at 11, 12, when, I mean, 17, 18 years old, these kids are quote unquote playing a, a lower level of hockey. <clears throat> Yet they're still uh, they're still going on to pretty impressive careers in hockey. Going down a little bit further, so Division One, you know, in, in the U.S., most kids aspire to play college hockey. There were 203 players from Minnesota in Division One hockey last year. 145 from Michigan, 113 from Massachusetts, and for women, it's not even close. Uh, Minnesota had 147. Uh, Massachusetts, that's three times more than Massachusetts at 42 and Illinois at 36. And um, again, majority of these kids played high school hockey through their senior year. And some people might look at these stats and go, well, yeah, of course you guys have the most at those levels. It's because you have the most players. And to that, I would say exactly. Our model helps produce the most players because it's such an easy access into hockey. And then there's one more illustration I just think was more funny than anything, but in 2016 when USA Hockey announced their world, women's world roster for the U18 team, this was taken right out of their press release. They announced a 22-player roster. 22 players represent seven different states. Minnesota leads the pack with 16, followed by California, Illinois, Massachusetts, North Dakota, Rhode Island, and Washington with one each. So almost matter-of-factly, it's just kind of... You know, Minnesota's got this many and the rest have this many. Just kind of a throw in. So that guy in Michigan that, that talked to me about, you know, the threats facing Minnesota, he, he says this, um, Minnesota's special sauce is they have more 17 year olds that th still think they are hockey players. And that's kind of like me. I played in high school and I still thought I was a high school, or still thought I was a hockey player. I'm a hockey player now, I still play. And, you know, that's all of us, hopefully, is that we all keep playing the game. So there's a, a cautionary tale here, and this is why I'm, I'm really passionate about sharing this with people all over, especially in Minnesota, because Minnesotans sometimes don't know how we have it or how good we have it. That cautionary tale is Massachusetts, and you've heard me talk about Massachusetts throughout this, comparing them to Minnesota. Uh, and I am not here to bash Massachusetts in any way, although it might come across as that. There's a guy in Massachusetts who has my role as, a, as executive director. He's a great guy. <clears throat> He's doing amazing things to grow hockey there. So I certainly am not trying to bash what they do in Massachusetts. But I think if you're familiar with the movie the Miracle and you know the Miracle on Ice story, it was all about Massachusetts and Minnesota, kids from those two states battling it out against each other and they had to come together to, to pull off this miracle. And that, that really was true at that time. It was Minnesota and Massachusetts, those were the two hockey producing states in, in the US. That's really the only two. And I often say Massachusetts at that time was better at being Minnesota than Minnesota was. They had more elite players. Um, that Olympic team had more Minnesotans, but in general Massachusetts was producing more elite hockey players. But at that time, both states were community-based. They both had a high school model. Massachusetts a little more prep school than, than high school, but still, the, you know, same thing. But something happened in the 80s in Massachusetts where their arenas became, their public arenas became privatized. Club hockey teams started taking over and, and pay-to-play pay to junior hockey sort of became the norm there. So some things that happen, and you're not gonna be able to see this graph, but just know that those blue bars are Massachusetts and the red bars are Minnesota. And this measures NHL players dating back to 1999, 2000. So you can kind of see how Massachusetts is ahead for a while. And then when those kids of the 80s kind of grew up, you see a massive shift where Minnesota has by far more NHL produced players um, than Massachusetts. Same thing in Division One. so back in 2002, 2003, Minnesota had 204 kids in Division One hockey, and Massachusetts was right behind them at 185. And go back two years ago, Minnesota had 207 to Massachusetts 115. So even though hockey exploded in other areas like California and Florida, Colorado, um, Texas, thanks in large part to the, the efforts of USA Hockey to grow the game, 
Minnesota still kind of held its market share in Division One hockey, while Massachusetts went went way down. And then I kind of like to just look at this one because I find it interesting. In the five years that NHL players have been at the Olympics, 1998 was the first year. In that first year, Massachusetts had five players. Minnesota had two. In 02, Minnesota had one player. That was Phil Housley. He was 40 years old at the time. Massachusetts had seven, and that includes guys like Jeremy Roenick, Tony Amante, uh, Keith Kachuk, probably three of the best American players ever produced. And then fast forward to the last Olympics, Minnesota had eight players on that team, and Massachusetts had zero. So my point, if you're sitting there asking why I talked all this time and didn't have a point. So you guys are the leaders and influencers in youth hockey in Manitoba. Um, so I know you guys have a community-based model, and that's why you're here. Um, but I would just ask that if you see threats coming into Manitoba that might affect how you can get more kids playing hockey, I would ask why and ask if there's a way to fix that. Um, I'm not trying to tell you that you should do things exactly the way Minnesota does. I'm not saying <clears throat> you got to have high school hockey in Manitoba or any other state needs to have high school hockey and then you'll be fine. That's, I'm a realist and I realize that's not how it, how it works. Uh, but I do just want you to get, think differently about ways to grow the game and ways to inspire kids um, as you're going back to your communities and, and trying to get more kids playing. So in Minnesota, we had 18,000 eight and under players last year. That was a new uh, national record. It broke our record that Minnesota set the previous year, which was 17,600. Um, so I'd like to say I had anything to do with it. I had nothing to do with it. I think part of it was because of our model and our community-based structure and our high school hockey programs. But we have a lot of communities that struggle to grow hockey too. And um, some do it better than others. And so that's why I'm finally getting to what Peter, I think, originally asked me to talk about. So sorry for taking so long. But <laughs> a few things that you can write down and take back, and I apologize, but I think that probably all of these things are things that you've thought of already. But what we've noticed is associations that grow the fastest have someone that is strictly dedicated to growing the game on their board. Uh, it's what they do. <clears throat> they don't get paid, but it's their job. And uh, the association gives them all the resources they need, you know, money for marketing, ice time that they might need for any on-ice events. Uh, they'll buy space to rent out for parties and welcome to hockey parties, things like that. So if you have a recruiting coordinator, great. Give them all the resources they need. If you don't, make sure you get one. Uh, the other program, um, I think probably our most successful program in recent years in growing hockey was our, <clears throat> our Little Wild Learn to Play program. It's something we introduced four years ago in Minnesota in partnership with the Wild. Uh, and since then, the NHL uh, and NHLPA got together and they're now doing this in all NHL markets. <clears throat> I think Winnipeg has a, a program similar to this, although I think it might be structured a little differently. But just real quick, how we structured it was we aimed it at five to eight-year-olds who've never played hockey before. Uh, if you've played hockey before, you're, you're not eligible. We did not do four-year-olds because we, I feel strongly that if you're putting your kid in hockey at four years old, there's no worry about you becoming a hockey family. Those families are in. Once you get to five, six, seven... Uh, those families are not quite in yet. They might need something to push them over the hump. So for 100 bucks, they get four ice sessions and they get head-to-toe equipment, including skates and a stick. So it's a really good deal. Varies by NHL market on what, um, what they provide and the cost, but I don't think anyone costs more than 100 bucks. Um, and we do it for four weeks in September. Some teams do it in the winter, some do it in the spring or summer. We really felt... Um, Doing it in the fall is the perfect lead into the season to get kids excited about it and then hopefully signing up for their local association. Uh, and I, I should say, too, that other teams do six to eight weeks. We stuck with four because we thought that that was uh, just enough to figure out if a kid likes it or not. Um, if you don't have a community that uh, benefits from a, a learn-to-play program with an NHL team, I would strongly encourage a low-cost entry program that's four to six weeks. Again, getting kids on the ice, trying it out um, once a week. Don't 
you know, push it on them, just kind of let them go out there, have fun, do different station-based practices, and, and just get a feel for being on the ice and having fun with, with kids in their community. Uh, we have an equipment grant program called Gear Up Minnesota. We partnered with Total Hockey, which is now Pure Hockey. But what it is is associations will apply to Minnesota Hockey for equipment grants throughout the year. We'll rank them, figure out who, uh, who kind of earned the most, but we'll award associations anywhere from five to 20 sets of starter gear each year. It's brand new gear. It includes everything except for skates and a stick, but helmet, breezers, all, hockey pants, all those things are included. And the associations can give those to kids who are just trying out hockey, ask for it back the next year, and they can keep you know, recycling those for two, three, four years as long as the equipment lasts, and they can apply every year too. So one year they might get 20, might, one year they might get five, one year they might get 10, but if they keep applying, they're gonna have quite a few sets of gear to, to share with, uh, with newcomers to hockey. And then there's things, you know, bring a friend, bring a friend programs. I'm sure, you know, people have thought of that, but if you can incentivize kids to show up and bring a, a kid that's new to hockey, um, that's a great thing. You know, community events are big in Minnesota. Parades, festivals, pizza parties, bringing them to um, high school games or, or college games and setting up parties with the little kids and the high school or college players, those always seem to go over well. And then, uh, you know, one program that we're implementing this year in Minnesota is a family mentor program. Sometimes when we're close to hockey, we forget how intimidating it can be for someone who's brand new to hockey and their kid comes home and says, I want to try that. Um, for a lot of new parents, that's a very daunting thing. So this program is aimed at, at those new families. We have associations figure out, okay, get some returning families or some families that have been part of the community for a long time, peewee age or you know, 10, 11, 12 years old for the kids that, that are returning and then meet with these new families that have a mite starting hockey. And so the, the older kid works with the younger kid on the ice, welcomes them to the rink, gives them a jersey. The parents welcome the parents, give them a cup of coffee, go sit in the stands while the two kids are on the ice and just kind of walk them through. Here's what it's like to play hockey <clears throat> in this association. Here's some things you need to know. Here's what you should stay away from, those types of things. And it requires some vetting, especially for those mentor families. So you're So they're not saying, oh, yeah, you know, Make sure you go to this uh, this guy who does edge work, and you know it's only five thousand bucks, but he's great with edges. Um, so we do a little bit of vetting on that, but uh, for the most part, um, I think that's going to be a very successful program. So things like that um, are things that we're trying to do in Minnesota to get more kids playing. But I would just say in closing. As you're thinking about growing the game, you can do any of these things. Hopefully, maybe you're already doing some of them. I'm sure they are because they're nothing uh, extraordinary. But I would also say just, just figure out what inspires kids in your community. What what would make those little kids want to play? And, and I think the good news is in Manitoba, that's probably easier than in many other parts of the, of the United States. But um, you know, hopefully, I gave you something to think about. And hopefully, maybe you can look at things and uh, at the very least, say, hey, man, we, we've got it pretty good here in Manitoba because um, <clears throat> we do have those older kids, uh, those older teams that, that inspire kids around here. You have an NHL team in Winnipeg. So um, so I would just say figure out what inspires kids and, and use that to your best ability. Thank you.